Well, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar focused on the sixth year curriculum and the shift to a new student life cycle. My name is Amrita Alawalia, and I'm the managing editor of The Evolution. For those of you who, who are new to our publication, The Evolution is an online newspaper founded by Destiny Solutions to focus on non traditional higher education. We publish articles and interviews by leaders across the post secondary space, including uh, today's panelists focused on how the higher education industry is changing and how institutions are adapting to keep pace. During today's discussion, we're going to cover five topics to help provide an overview of the direction we believe higher education to be moving. We'll start off by providing some context around the need for change in higher education. We'll then reflect on some of the obstacles to the sustainability of higher education status quo and then discuss the characteristics of student centricity and what makes a college or university truly student centric. I'll then briefly introduce the sixth year curriculum concept, and at that point, we'll turn to our panel. We're fortunate to be joined by two panelists who've been central in driving the sixth year curriculum model into the mainstream. Today's panelists are Hunt Lambert, the Dean of Extension and Continuing Education at Harvard University, and Roby Brannon, the Vice Provost for Continuum, uh, Continuum College at the University of Washington. Very briefly, guys, say hi. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, if you guys have questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A box to send them to us. We'll try our best to leave time for questions at the end, but if we run to the end of the hour, we'll be sure to follow up individually. Now, I want to start this conversation by, by providing a little bit of context to why we're talking about this. Um, by highlighting a few key market trends, what I'm hoping to do is shed some light on why we need to be thinking differently about the role and responsibility of post-secondary institutions of all stripes. So let's start off with this, uh, the boogeyman of automation. Now, automation is driven by something called Moore's Law, which suggests that the processing power of computers doubles every approximately two years, every 18 months. Now, this is what's driving the automation of tasks, and in some cases, jobs, and what's driving the need for constant reskilling and upskilling. As more of people's time is freed up from doing manual or repeatable tasks, there's greater expectation from employers for them to conduct high-value work. It's the role of upskilling and reskilling programming to help individuals keep pace with those changing expectations. There's also a distinct need to create access to retraining programs for individuals who will be structurally unemployed by rapidly advancing technologies to create pathways to more sustainable careers. And fundamentally, as new careers start emerging, to create opportunities for them to, to keep pace and to get relevant learning that's going to help them keep, uh, keep up with the changing job market. Second trend I want to talk about is attainment and completion. Now, in order to support the continued growth of the economy and adapt to the impact of automation, the Lumina Foundation has set a goal of a 60% attainment rate by 2025. Now, that's an attainment rate uh, is not just the, completion, the degree completion rate, but also includes non-degree credentials. A 60% uh, attainment rate is fundamental to making sure that enough people uh, have the qualifications necessary to enter the middle skill and high skill jobs that the more automated labor market will provide. Now, we're currently not on track to meet that goal. The focus of our colleges and universities must be on conferring high quality credentials, now accredited degrees and industry recognized certificates and certifications that help people enter, uh, access entry level jobs and gain basic employment skills that help them advance their careers. It's essential to deliver credentials that, at minimum, create pathways to these middle skill jobs, and then beyond that, create access to relevant programming that's going to support individuals' competitiveness in a changing labor market. Which brings us to the question of, frankly, the sustainability of the traditional higher education model. Now, I, I want to stop here because one of, one of the, the, the fears whenever, whenever someone talks about a new model is, is the, uh, the concern about throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, and I, I want to... I want to take a step back to, you know, there's always going to be a market for the traditional sort of start of career education programming. But people are living longer. They're working longer careers. And as we discussed, the demands of jobs continues to evolve. Fundamentally, people are no longer living three-stage lives. Today, lives are multi-stage and complex. They require more diverse education engagements to meet them at various stages along, along their life path. And though learners are constantly engaging in ongoing learning, they might not recognize the difference between a high quality credential, which is going to count towards the attainment rate, and an education engagement that's not going to provide them meaningful progression. For many students, they're focused on outcomes alone, which means it's more important than ever for post-secondary institutions to recognize that their potential learners are customers in a complex and crowded market. 
So with that, I think it's really important that we introduce this idea of rethinking our concern with the idea of customer service. Now, non-traditional students are in pursuit of concrete outcomes that will support their career progression. They also have limited time at their disposal to invest in higher education. It's the responsibility of institutions who serve learners to ensure they can focus as much of their limited time as possible on learning rather than on bureaucracy. And that's the point that Heather's making here. It introduces us to the importance of conscious design to achieve student centricity. Recognizing students as customers is a first step, but the hard work comes with delivering an environment that treats them that way. To deliver on this vision, post-secondary institutions need to closely examine their processes and infrastructure to ensure they're actually student-centric. Now, student-centricity really has to become more than a buzzword to serve modern learners. It's, it's really a never-ending pursuit. It requires every aspect of the institution, from program design to the ad drop process to even just the copy on the website, to be angled and designed specifically to serve the learners coming through their doors. And that's fundamentally, that's where Mark is coming from here with this quote. Institutional processes have iterated and institutional process approaches to serving learners have iterated, but they've never really evolved. We've found ways to make the status quo faster and easier, but have we really explored alternatives to the status quo in, in a scalable fashion? Fundamentally, that's why alternative providers are making so much headway in this space. We're seeing robust competition for students looking for upskilling and reskilling opportunities from broadly the non-institution and new institutional sector. As Ian points out here, there's a number of players in the education market. Aside from you know, the full gamut of colleges and universities, we have to be aware of MOOC providers, boot camps, lynda.com, Salesforce Trailhead, Microsoft Education, Amazon Education, and a suite of other organizations offering non-degree programming. The institutional brand really only carries so much weight. It'll get individuals to look at your offerings, but their decision to register comes down to how aligned the program and institution are with their needs and expectations. So as we get into this idea of a student-centric institution, it's important to sort of recognize some of these fundamental changes in the characteristics of modern students. Now this chart, I believe, provides a really interesting overview of the expectations of modern learners, but I want to highlight three specific aspects for today's discussion. First, I want to point out this idea of just-in-time learning. It, it speaks to the importance of delivering timely programming that's responsive and relevant to learners' needs. We need to be aware of the idea of, you know, separating outcomes from degrees and recognizing what we're actually conferring. You know, are, are learners necessarily looking for a piece of paper alone, or are they looking for pathways to specific outcomes? And then finally, the idea of universal outcome acceptance is one that requires a, a lot more attention than it tends to get. It questions how well communicated learner outcomes are outside the institution. Do employers or even learners themselves have a clear uh, sense of skills, competencies, and outcomes from the available credentials and transcripts? Being truly student-centric also requires the post-secondary institution to understand their true value proposition for learners. Colleges and universities can no longer differentiate themselves as just gatekeepers of knowledge because, frankly, education and information is everywhere. Each, learner, or each institutional leader has to ask themselves, who are our students? Why did they enroll? Are we meeting their needs and expectations? You know, we're comfortable with this idea of the pedagogical reasoning behind moving from the sage on the stage model to the guide on the side model, but it needs to go past the classroom. And to that end, we have to rethink to a certain extent the role of the institution itself. This is a great quote from Hunt, and, and as he's on the line with us today, I'd love to invite him to quickly provide some more context to this idea that he's sharing here. Thanks, Amrit, and thank you all for joining us today. The idea here is when we as the Extension School mapped out the 60-year expected work life and learning life of a student, and we map into that the various exposures they're likely to have to us, either undergraduate or graduate, graduate certificate, and then all the training and other aspects that happen in their jobs and across other schools, and you start to add it up. For the average learner, they're unlikely to take more than 20% of their activities, uh, their learning activities over that 60 years from credit programs we offer, which suggests that if you're gonna serve a student successfully over time, you have to have a services concept that allows you to recommend yourself and others. Now, 
as we start sort of repositioning the college or university as, as a supporter of a, of a student's lifelong journey, as, as the conduit, not the sort of endpoint in and of itself, we start to get to this idea, as Hunt alluded to, of the 60-year curriculum. Fundamentally, the 60-year curriculum requires us to consciously engage with learners contextually over the course of their 100-year life from K to 12 through to retirement. Now, what I'm going to ask everyone to do here is we have a poll set up. And I would love to get your thoughts on where you see the greatest opportunity for colleges and universities to serve new audiences. Is that in sort of K to 12, the offering of K to 12 programming designed for learners who are, who are um, still in high school or earlier? Is it in professional development for, for working adults? Or is it in sort of education geared towards senior citizens that, and looking for personal development and, and things like OLI or even if we're looking at uh, broad retraining for, uh, for senior citizens. So I'd like you to take a few minutes just to, to share your thoughts on this topic. Or a few seconds rather. <laughs> As we think about the 60-year curriculum, you know, fundamentally, the, the, the concept provides learners with ownership over their education history, but it pushes post-secondary institutions to provide them with regular and substantive value uh, over the course of their lifetime. You know, rather than seeing learner engagement as a single standalone event driven exclusively by programmatic content and the desire of students, it gives us sort of opportunity to rethink some of the fundamental building blocks of post-secondary programming. We need to rethink course design, customization. We need to rethink flexibility and personalization. We need to rethink credentialing. And thank you again, everyone, for sharing your thoughts on that. It seems there's a, a pretty significant sway towards serving professional, uh, working professionals. Um, so what I want to do here is uh, now start to turn our attention a little bit towards how we deliver on the promise of the 60-year curriculum. Um, both Hunt and, and Rovi, um, oh, pardon me, both Hunt and Rovi uh, have highlighted five key areas for strategic development, which we're going to dive into in more detail here. The metacurriculum over a 60-year working life, learner services, policies and funding, credentials, and the new academic tech staff. Now, Rovi is going to briefly discuss each idea, and then we'll address some questions as time allows. Additionally, uh, again, I'd like to encourage attendees to please use the Q&A box if you have burning questions you'd like answered. Uh, and again, we'll try to leave some time at the end to address them. Uh, and Rovi, what I'd like you to do even before we dive in is I know I gave a very, very high level quick overview of sort of my perception of the 60-year curriculum, but could you jump in and maybe provide a little more color on, on what you, how you define the 60-year curriculum? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today uh, on this uh, webcast. Uh, I think uh, we want to give credit certainly to Gary Matkin down at UC Irvine, who really coined this phrase as a part of a strategic plan that they were developing uh, for their extension unit and continuing education unit at University of California, Irvine. And from that, uh, Hunt, uh, Hunt Lambert, who's on this call, myself and a few others have really taken that concept and uh, continue to explore and expand it. And uh, we, we do like to say, I think that um, it's one way to think about this is the term lifelong learning has been around for a very long time, but we like to think that's what the learners need to do. Uh, the 60 year curriculum reflects what institutions need to do to support a learner over a much more um, extended life, uh, lifetime than we've had today. Uh, it is a term of art. Uh, we readily admit that. If you look up the Webster defin definition of the word curriculum, there are many things that are uh, sort of in violation of that strict dictionary def definition of curriculum, um, you know, a, a subset of uh, content leading to a particular spe specialization, whereas a 60-year curriculum is going to be made up of many different specializations over the course of a lifetime, just uh, for example. <clears throat> but I think that uh, if you really think about this as saying um, uh, the average 18-year-old today, and you alluded to this uh, earlier, the average 18-year-old today uh, has a better than 50% chance to live past 100 years old. And I think as soon as you begin thinking about that, realizing where we are with understanding a two-year degree or a four-year degree or even a master's degree on top of that, uh, really two to six years of education and what is likely to be a 60-year working lifespan from 25 to 85. And this is according uh, to the authors Grattan and Scott who wrote The 100-Year Life, Living and Working in an Age of Longevity. And so we've begun to say that a 100-year life is going to need a 60-year curriculum to support it. Uh, 
That's not continuous education. These are discrete educational moments throughout someone's life, but connected together in ways that I think we haven't done thus far when we think about a student's engagement with college being for a limited duration. So, I mean, that's a broad sense of, of, of the piece, uh, pieces that we put into the 60-year curriculum, but it really is a new way to focus our efforts and look across a lifespan rather than a particular moment in time within a lifespan. Now, before we dive into uh, each of these five areas, um, we've had a few folks mention that uh, the slides aren't advancing uh, on their screens. Uh, if you refresh the screen, uh, it should begin advancing uh, and keeping pace with, with us, but I apologize for, uh, for, for the issues, that, the, the tech issues you, you guys might be encountering. Now, let's get into the, the meta curriculum. So, the meta curriculum over a 60-year working life. Roby, this is a very complicated word. Um, so, could you start off by sort of un helping to unpack what a meta curriculum is, uh, and then shed a little light, light on on what the meta curriculum over a six year working life is? And, and Hunt, please jump in as as uh, Rovi's explaining. Well, uh, I, this is a great question. I think the the first thing is uh, it is a complicated term, but. Uh, but we know in higher education, when you want something to sound more academic, we put the word meta in front of it. So that's part of it. Um, but, but really, um, uh, realistically, what we're talking about is, is, again, that concept that I was speaking of earlier, is thinking not in terms of a curriculum at a particular moment in time, but what is sort of a curriculum of curricula, if you will, across somebody's lifetime that we think about. And I'll just tell you a very simple exercise that we engaged in that everybody can do very quickly uh, and I and, uh, credit Hunt for doing this at a workshop at, at Harvard a couple of years ago. It was very instructive, and that is to have an X and Y axis. And on your X axis, put decades of life. And for us, uh, because we have summer youth camps, we actually start at 10 years old, and we ran out to 110 years old. And then we put our programs on the Y axis, and we looked at where the breadth of ages are that are covered within our program array. And from that moment, you can begin to see where you have the preponderance of coverage and curriculum uh, today. So for us, I think looking, that was our first pass at Continuum College at the University of Washington to say, what does our meta curriculum look like? How well are we serving students over the course of their lifetimes? And, and we do have, we have summer youth camps which serve eight-year-olds. We have an Osher Lifelong Learning Institute with an average age of 75, but we have 98-year-olds, so eight to 98 already in this portfolio, but when you begin to break that down a little bit further, of course you see the preponderance of support, and we saw this reflected in our, in our quick poll. Uh, a lot of our programming and continuing education is really focused around that mid-career professional today if you look at it in bulk. But as that begins to spread out across a lifetime, the 60-year curriculum, a meta-curriculum, is a way of looking at our program array today across our institutions and deciding where we might have gaps in serving students either as an individual institution, I think as Hunt noted, not every institution is going to serve every need themselves, and being very strategic to say, look, we're going to serve students in this range and that range, but we'll work with partners to serve uh, folks in the other range. So it really is a way to look at the overall uh, set of offerings at an institution and make some strategic decisions about which parts of the 60-year curriculum make the most sense for, uh, for your institution to serve. And Hunt, I don't know if you have more to add to that, but uh, I know you, you've thought a lot about this as well. I do, and, and thank you, Rovi. What, what I'd like to point out that I, has helped me is something that the 60-year curriculum is not. The 60-year curriculum is not an attempt to tell a 20-year-old, here's your course of study for the next 60 years. What we did, uh, similar to what uh, Washington did, is we said, who do we serve today? And we have learners between age 15 and 95, but the bulk of them are between 15 and 75. And we can map every program we offer onto those learners, and we can see that there's a concentration around 34. But then you ask the question, if you're gonna to live to be 100, and if you're gonna work 60 or more years, uh, according to the analysis in 100 year life, what are the stages you have to go through and what are the economic requirements to be able to retire? And when you look at those stages, you'll see that people will change roles substantively um, probably five times. So instead of a three-stage life, they're going to have a six or seven-stage life. And in today's workforce, changing roles means more education, not just skills training on an assembly line. And then you map that against what we do, and you see that there are huge holes 
in the products off we offer and also the services. And so our idea of a 60-year curriculum is to consciously plug those gaps so that you can have a relationship with a learner throughout their learning life. And regardless of where they go, they know there's at least one person who has a record of what they're doing and is advising and coaching them on career, on life, on transition management, and the next educational experience they need to succeed. So back to you. Absolutely, and I know we're going to talk a little bit more about what those learner services really look like within this revised concept of the institution. Now, I want to ask you guys, you know, delivering a meta curriculum, the starting point is really understanding what offerings are available within the institution today? What are our faculty designed programming and, and how can we make sure that they're accessible to people across, you know, up, across various life stages at various more accessible points? What does it take sort of to build stronger relationships between, as it currently sits, continuing education and quote unquote the main campus to create that kind of symbiotic relationship where more folks have, have access to offerings that are, are generally gated and generally, um, you know, within the, these very um, strict confines of degree programs? Well, happy to jump in here and uh, and say so I think you know one of the advantages we have at University of Washington is Continuum College is a very integrated part of the institution. We don't grant degrees ourselves, but we support over 111 uh, professional master's degree uh, programs uh, across our campus, and so that gives us a lot of connectivity into our campus to have these conversations. I think what we're excited about is that um, it's no longer just the people in continuing education who are beginning to talk about this. We're hearing this from across our campus now, faculty and others beginning to realize, and they're seeing it in their own student populations that are beginning to diversify across the age spectrum uh, to a greater extent, especially in those professional programs uh, where, where people are in many cases beginning to feel a little bit older than uh, previous and in some cases a little bit younger than what we've typically seen in master's degree programs. And so part of this is making sure, I think if for continuing education units that have a lot of experience to share that experience with the units and departments on campus uh, to begin to help people understand what it means to teach uh, adult students, students with different uh, components in their lives, uh, in their lifespan that are happening than a traditional age student might have. And so we see a groundswell of support coming from across our institution, but we think we're at the very beginning of this. And, and of course, uh, speaking as someone who, who works uh, today at a traditional age uh, institution, for the most part, uh, we, we see this as real progress toward an understanding that education is going to be across the lifespan and not just isolated to uh, uh, two or three different moments in someone's life. I'd like to add to that uh, the context that higher ed as an industry tends to think of itself as a monolithic service that has been optimized for almost a thousand years for a traditional age student and a PhD student. And I don't want us to forget that over that thousand years, they've become very, very good at it. And for the segments of the population that can go to a full-time residential program, most of the programs are unbelievably good. But in the market in the United States today, 85% of all the people who participate in higher ed are non-traditional. They're adults, they're working full-time, they have families. And higher ed has never made a conscious adjustment in its core programs to serve them. That's why business schools and other professional schools rose on the edge. That's why CE units rose on the edge. And what we're seeing now as students demand this lifelong learning from us is the rise of the rest of us that serve a different student, somebody who mostly only can come part-time and can only attend uh, when they can control time and place of learning. And that's a completely different definition of student success. Student success in a traditional program, PhD, well understood. But student success in a meta curriculum over 60 years has a lot more to do with enabling a person to achieve their personal and work goals than it does with earning a degree in a disciplinary area to go into that area or go on to a PhD. Absolutely. Well, let's move on uh, <laughs> to, to the idea of learner services. And again, Rovi here, I'll, I'll ask you to, to take over, to introduce the concept and give us a feel for how learner services need to evolve to deliver a six-year curriculum. 
Sure. Well, I think we're touching on some of these ideas already, and so some of this will be a little bit uh, potentially redundant. But I think what we're seeing is the complexity of the landscape is increasing. The options and opportunities are uh, growing across the spectrum. And, and we already see, for example, the role of advisors today is not the role of advising that existed uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And we see increases in professionalized advising at many campuses uh, for that reason. And that's dealing with students largely within the academic program or just starting a program. Um, we see down in some places, and again, our colleague uh, Gary Mackin down at UC Irvine, they've consolidated career services in the uh, continuing education unit rather than in traditional undergraduate because they are beginning to see people come back and say, I don't just need help with my first resume, I need help with my third, fourth, and fifth job. So you begin to think of these career services becoming much more integrated over a lifespan rather than for a very short period uh, of time. We are already seeing retention coaching uh, beginning to spread in certain places, uh, other forms of within program curricular uh, services to help students that are very busy, adult students, as Hunt mentioned, coming from very different perspectives, different kinds of services necessary to supplement folks as they're moving through. Um, you know, we, we've, we've speculated that we could see the advent of what we might call a learning concierge, or I've talked about the idea that we might have a learning record counselor, someone who helps you make sense of your own learning data so that you can make the next best choice for you in this complicated uh, landscape based on your personal learning history. I think that's still a few years away, but uh, we, we see students coming back and, and as analytics become uh, more common and as students get access to those analytics, they're gonna to wanna to know what they mean and how they can use them. Much like a genetic counselor will work with someone with genetic data. Uh, so that's a bit of a future sense of what that might look like, but we already see an expansion of learner services, uh, some of which are growing within faculty, but some of which are augmenting the faculty in new and different ways. Um, I will just give one example here at Continuum College. We have 24 different professional programs with the word data in the title, data science, data engineering, a master's degree, a certificate program, and just helping an adult navigate that space and say, which is the right one for me at this point in my career uh, is, uh, it, it's very different than what we used to have uh, 15 or 20 years ago when a field might be uh, more uniformly um, uh, identified with a particular topic or subject area. And uh, as learners um, increasingly diversify across the spectrum, so will the programming that's necessary to serve all of those folks. And so we're going to see different kinds of services that will evolve uh, over time to support um, uh, the 60-year curriculum. And this is Hunt again. And I'd add to that this idea that when you get beyond college, what it takes to succeed in school typically is not your ability to do the academic work. It's the ability to have the money, the time, the emotional support uh, to do the work, to pass the programs, and a clear path to attach that to a reward, a promotion, or just doing your job better or a new job. And if you look at the breadth of learner services it takes to do that, and you look at the nature of trust in the world today, I think our great education institutions are one of the last places where there is a lot of trust. And I think it's on us for our communities to have these broad learner services that let the student trust you and engage with you. And I'll give you an idea of one experiment we're doing with this. Uh, we have taken all of the pathways students have taken through our 1,200 odd open access courses that have led to successful degree completion and looked at it with an AI. And the AI has found patterns based on the order you take the courses and your goals. And we've been able to turn that into a support tool for our advisors so that when a learner gets on the phone with them and says, what course should I take next, given my path through this degree and given my goals, they actually have some insight from the data that say, take this course, not that course. And your odds of succeeding over the long term go up by 4%. And we're just beginning to discover what that breadth of learner services looks like when you put life coaching, career coaching, and academic coaching together in a single person that a student trusts. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, 
Moving on to credentials, I mean, uh, evolving our, approaching, our, our approach to credentialing is uh, a topic I touched on a little bit earlier. Again, uh, Rovi, I'd ask you to introduce the concept. And, um, you know, as you guys are speaking, if you could share, you know, some of the common objections that you tend to hear around the potential for, for badges and certificates, maybe from, from main campus colleagues or from elsewhere in the higher education space. Sure. Well, uh, we talked a lot about credentials, and I think specifically digital credentials, and, and uh, we can go down a couple of different paths here. One of those is to start talking about alternative credentialing and badging and so forth. And, and I think clearly we, we have a, a big conversation about creeping credentialism, which is a potential problem that we want to make sure we address. If that's locking more people out of the system than le letting people in, then that's, uh, that's not the intent. But let me take a step back just a moment and just, uh, just say at the high level, why we think uh, digital credentialing, especially the move to digital is so absolutely critical. <clears throat> um, right now, when you get a credential, usually a certificate or a degree, it's a, a generally a piece of paper, uh, maybe a scanned PDF uh, and that's emailed to you in some cases, uh, but that contains just a very few bits of information, maybe four or five bits of information, your name, uh, the name of the institution, uh, maybe your major and the signatures of a couple of people that you'll probably never meet down at the bottom of your credential. And so, you know, that's what that credential can tell somebody about what you earn that. And then there's a lot of inferences that come from that based on the institution, the ranking of the institution and so forth. So we have all these other mechanics that sit behind a traditional degree. <clears throat> when a degree becomes digital, those aren't the only bits of information that can be held. We can now have every syllabus, uh, in addition to all the transcripting components, there's a lot more that could go into a credential than what we see today. And this is why we think digital credentialing, regardless of the formats it takes, whether it's badging or uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, smaller credentials and so forth, and I think there are roles for that, just moving credentials into a digital format are going to change the game pretty substantially in terms of how people use credentials, how employee employers use credentials to look for employees and so forth. And so... Uh, we, we think that one of the one of the things, and I think that Hunt would agree with me here, that several of us are po positing is that digital credentials need to be owned by the student as well as the data that is created, and we need to start to move toward a world in which the ethical and consented use of that data is baked into the way that we operate, and that's a really big challenge even for us in higher education. <clears throat> so, so a few different paths that we could go down there, but I would say, you know, as we move to digital credentialing, it's going to give much greater insight into what, to the, what a student has gone through allow students to stitch together learning experiences. As Hunt, uh, Hunt's slide earlier showed, less than 20% will come from a single institution. If you as a, as a learner own your own digital credentials, you could have some uh, a certificate from the University of Washington, a learning experience from Harvard, your employer's um, digital that, you know, credentials could be for training, uh, and then you could come back in and go to your local community college, get a new two-year degree, and still have all of that history connected together. And uh, several of us are working on what this might look like in practice. It's, it's very exciting. We don't have all of the infrastructure pieces there, but digital credentialing especially uh, is, is going to be critically important as we, uh, as we look into the future and how we're going to be viewed as higher education institutions. I'd add to that this thought that in an economy where somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the employees needed a bachelor's degree, it was relatively easy and straightforward for hires, uh, companies, to simply use the bachelor's degree as a screen as to whether you got in or not, and that still primarily works. But as you move into a situation where 60 percent need post-secondary education in the future workforce, and at the same time, these capabilities for digital credentialing come into being. And at the same time, the ability to democratize, it, to democratize ownership of those credentials to the individual. You're now in a very different situation where these digital credentials are necessary and they're essentially assets that you have on deposit in your, we'll call it a blockchain, that let you connect with a company and find work opportunities. And as that happens, the value of the degree as a meta symbol of capability will decline in many areas and companies will be able to be much more surgical in hiring the type of person they need. And what that depends on is that these digital credentials have metadata in them that makes sense to the hirer. And there's been some great work going in that area by Strata uh, in Indianapolis along with Gallup 
who are putting together a skills-based inventory of words that align the jobs that can be used in that metadata. And what I see coming together over time are the maintenance of value of what the bachelor's and master's degrees mean, but a great rise in value of what the subcontext in their majors, minors, fields of study, technical certification, licensing certification, and right down to very fine technical pieces you can put on digitally. But most importantly in that to me is giving the user control of it. So the only time that data can be used by a company to find you is when you want to be found. And that's where this trust network, this idea of privacy, the type of control you can get with a blockchain becomes so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So moving on to, I guess, the, the framework, the foundation that this is all structured within, is when we start talking about a new academic tech stack. Um, so I'm going to turn it over again to, to Roby uh, to introduce the concept and to give us a feel for um, what this idea is. But while he's speaking, the, we have a, uh, a poll question we'd like for the, the audience to take a look at, which looks at which technological capacity you think is most, most critical to delivering a 60-year curriculum. Now, Roby, I'll turn it over to you again here. Uh, thank you. So we'll, we'll try to do two things at once, listen and, and fill out a poll. So I, I hope, uh, hope we're able to accomplish that today. Um, uh, I think when we talk about the new academic technology stack, uh, we, we've talked a lot uh, or a bit about digital credentialing. That is a part of what we'd be looking at. But I think uh, if we're talking about engaging with students over potentially 60, 70, or more years of their lifetime, that we need technology stacks that are based on relationships and not based on silos of data. And, uh, and that's a pretty big shift. I, I don't know about uh, those of you out on the webcast uh, today, but I know even at our institution, it can be a challenge cross-referencing data between two different systems, say a financial system and the student information system uh, as one example. Uh, so that we have silos of data that contain parts and pieces of a student's uh, history as they move through. Uh, and I would say that uh, even when a student comes back to us, uh, to take a, a master's degree. If they already went to our institution, we start, it's almost like uh, the old movie Groundhog Day. We start all over again by asking them to fill out an application and asking them to go through and uh, relate their history and, and so forth. And we can pull some of that data, but it's often painful and not based on the fact that that person will be someone we have a relationship with over time. Several of us, and, and Hunt can speak a lot more to this, uh, working with uh, customer relation management systems as the underlying uh, um, I call it a transport layer across different kinds of systems so we can pull that data in and make it actionable to those people who are offering the new learner services that we've talked about to faculty and most, most importantly, ultimately to the students themselves to understand uh, their own pathway or potential pathways through the learning experience. And so, so, the, so connecting the data together, being able to look across it using augmented uh, um, uh, intelligence uh, applications, uh, to find places where we might have systematic bias, systematic discrimination uh, within our programs, uh, I think on the programmatic side, or for students to find pathways that are better suited to their personal learning needs as they move on their own journeys as they move through. That's a completely different stack of technologies than a siloed learning management system, a siloed student information system, uh, and our financial systems being separate. I, I would just you know, ask everybody to think about our own experiences as we um, engage in retail or other kinds of technological experiences. Not that we're trying to make higher ed like retail, but on the service side of things, uh, it should not be more complicated than it needs to be for a student to engage with us, but it also should not be more complicated than it needs to be for us to get the data we need to make sure our programs are meeting the needs of a really uh, increasingly diverse student body as they move through our systems. This is, um, this is not a small, um, a small effort, but uh, some of us are trying it in uh, in, in small doses to to see what we can accomplish, and I think it's it's been pretty impressive. I think what Harvard Extension has done has been quite impressive with their ability to look at that data and analyze data. And Hunt, I don't know if you want to talk about some of those examples, but the the new stack is going to be um, very different than the way we have thought about uh, connecting our data services in the past. Thanks, Roby. When I got to Harvard and looked at our systems infrastructure, we had 167 different nodes just in the division of continuing ed, each of which contained various elements of data. And all of them were architected and designed from the supply side out, meaning they were ERPs or in 
uh, our language, SIS, as student information systems, which are fundamentally the presentation of a catalog and one way to buy within that catalog. When you think about the services we've described and the 60-year curriculum we've described, in order to make that work over time, the fundamental architecture needs to be from student need in. And so we chose Salesforce because it was the biggest, most available cloud-based CRM uh, that was in existence when we started, and they were just announcing the higher ed data architecture as the beginning of an architecture where all of this data could live and be analyzed. So we implemented Salesforce, and then we started with Informatica and other tools, and we connected every one of our systems into a data set that could be populated into Salesforce to look at it with CRM tools. As we did that, we started launching new products, which required us to have new ways to register, new ways to pay. And so we started building on top of that new interfaces with Target X and other pathways, new ways to apply. And one at a time, we're teasing apart everything we do, but it ties back now to a single CRM-based architecture for the data so that you can give relationship services and products uh, out of it. Uh, to say that we're halfway through is stretching it, but we have a working prototype and we'll register probably, it will probably have 50,000 enrollments this year that run through that. And we have 20 years of data from everything we've done that we've made visible to it. So we're, we're starting, we're testing this. And I think this is the new strategic information system of the future and that most higher ed is going to have to adopt this in order to keep their learners satisfied over the very long life they're going to have. And I saw one of the questions online had to do with alumni, and I would say absolutely, alumni are just the potential return students. Most alumni uh, never hear from their school again unless it's to give them money. And I would like to think someday a school would know more about uh, one of their graduates than, say, the fitness app on their watch does and could respond to needs uh, accordingly. So I think all of this does come together, but it takes a completely new academic stack and it needs to be one that higher ed can buy, which means to me it has to be a cloud-based services model uh, where we don't each have to go through an SIS upgrade size project in order to get into it. Now moving on finally, and. Uh, I apologize uh, to those of you who pointed it out. I had these uh, key strategic areas uh, incorrectly ordered in the introductory slide. We're going to be touching now on policies and, and funding. So uh, just to close us out on these, Roby, please uh, please dive in. Sure. Well, I, I want to make sure we have time too for some uh, to respond to some of these questions. But uh, but this is uh, each of these five areas we could do a full day uh, of, of conversation on and, and some of us have had uh, multiple days of, uh, of discussing this. You know, we're, we're uh, in the United States alone, we have $1.5 trillion of student debt. I think everybody on this webcast is probably well aware of these numbers. I was giving a, an interview to a student reporter on our own campus and um, uh, she was a junior and uh, she was asking about the importance of lifelong learning, and I said, well, this is just the beginning of your journey. You're going to have to keep learning throughout your lifetime, and she just about fell out of her chair, and the, the sort of veneer of, um, of reporter and administrator fell away, and it was more student and, and uh, vice provost for a moment, and she said, I, I can't believe I'm going to have to keep learning, and, I, and why, would, why would I have to keep learning after my degree? I'm, I'm having trouble just getting through my junior year and thinking about how I'm going to graduate, and um, I said, well, you know, imagine the iPhone is just over a decade old, about 12 years old now, and how much has changed in the world of, of uh, reporting in the last 10 to 12 years. And a colleague of mine who is a reporter, uh, I was telling him the story, and he just looked at me and said, oh, my gosh, if she doesn't realize that she's going to have to keep learning in this field, uh, she really needs to make sure that she understands that. But I think as we think about these funding and policy issues, um, we do have to recognize that for many students, that's a really scary prospect. How do we, how are they going to pay for that? Um, I think what's, what we're going to see is we have to form uh, a new social compact between government, uh, industry, and institutions, at least uh, as, it, as we think about how the evolution is occurring in the United States. And I think we're very early in talking about what this is uh, going to look like uh, in the future, but it's going to mean a different mix of opportunities. Uh, it will mean, I think as we've already discussed, 
different kinds of pathways for people who might be uh, the traditional college student coming through into the workforce, uh, but also how do you begin to have very high level different kinds of apprenticeships for those students who might not be ready for college, but maybe workforce ready and maybe college ready in five or six years. And so businesses have to be a part of that conversation. I think we are seeing in industries that are very hungry for talent and short on the ability to hire, they're moving much more aggressively into some of these spaces than, and, um, than in other fields, but it's growing as the economy continues to boom. Employers need uh, qualified folks to work. And so there, there are some signs that we're beginning to have different conversations with employers uh, about how, how we should function uh, for their, their lifelong learning needs. I think we, um, we see some experiments happening globally. Uh, some countries beginning to fund lifelong learning accounts that students can dip into as they need to. For example, um, in the UK, uh, they've recently passed a new law for apprenticeships where companies pay 3% of their, um, uh, 3 into a, a tax fund, but they can earn that back by hiring apprentices. And so their apprenticeship rates are going up pretty dramatically in the UK. So we see around the world some test cases of how this might evolve, but we're at the very beginning of this. I think for individuals, they're going to have to think about, much like you might think about a medical savings account for yourself, you may have to think about an educational savings account for yourself. Uh, again, we don't have policies in place to do that for, for individuals, for our, for our children we do, but I think as we think about what does this mean, what should I be putting away each year to plan for that moment where I need formal education again, and then how do the policies exist to be able to support that uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, a six-year graduation rate, four-year graduation rate, the way our creditors look at this, we might discover that for some people, a 10 or 15-year graduation rate is absolutely perfect for them, uh, and that's a way to bring more people in. So I think it's going to require looking at all of these different aspects of quality, uh, uh, completion rates, of how we fund this, and how we work together as a society to make sure we are improving uh, not just the access, but the attainment uh, goals for the United States moving forward. I'd, I'd like to take a crack at this through a question that Lorio from UCLA asked about higher ed becoming a massive training delivery mechanism and what might that do to a research institution mission and how might that affect campus and faculty in the next 10 or 20 years. And uh, I'm addressing that question through the policy because my first answer is it doesn't affect the mission of the research institution. What the research institutions and campuses do are still absolutely amazing. The question is, how many learners is it for compared to the workforce demands for post-secondary education? And it has always filled that requirement, but isn't now and won't in the future. There aren't enough seats and there aren't enough beds, and honestly, the workforce needs the people. So that suggests that the policies that lead to federal funding and state funding over time are likely to shift from having been aimed at providing subsidies to institutions to grow the traditional campuses, which was necessary and fantastically successful, to become an individual right to a certain amount of money in support of education, and you get to spend it where you want, and the places you spend it are expected to stack their credentials together into something that's meaningful. And so that leaves the campuses being good at what they're at now, good at now, but it leaves the extension schools and the divisions of continuing ed to build this infrastructure for the rest of the market, and it's likely to have an impact on the campus because it will move public money out of the institution and into the adult learner over time. And if tax structures aren't changed to make more money available to do that, then it could have a negative impact because we are an aging population. The number of entering freshmen for the next 18 years will go down because they're already born and we're constraining immigration in this country. And so if you want to advance the workforce, you have to educate the adults and you're probably going to have to move more public money there. Um, I happen to be a person who believes that we're growing the pie and that this will easily pay for itself with the tax receipts on a better educated workforce. Uh, but when you're a budget uh, analyst inside a state government, uh, you might not see it that way. 
Well, gentlemen, we're going to close out this particular part of the uh, of the presentation here uh, because I want to make sure that we have some time to address at least a few of the uh, the fantastic questions that you guys have been submitting over the course of this webinar. I think it's just important to frame, you know, as higher education begins to position itself to serve a 100-year life, we need to start exploring how to integrate the concepts of the six-year curriculum into our status quo, how to, how to evolve to, to deliver something that's not just an iteration of what we've always done. Um, personally, I believe that for most institutions to look at how to do this effectively, they need to lean on their colleagues in continuing and professional education divisions for strategic guidance, their experience, and for their vision. So I'm going to leave us on this slide here. Um, all the ideas we've been sharing are in, uh, in the evolution. Uh, we have a page specifically dedicated to the sixth year curriculum at evolution.com slash 60YC. If you'd like to subscribe, please, uh, I'm not sure if this is a clickable link, but uh, you can follow that URL to subscribe to our, our weekly newsletter. Um, and with that, guys, let's get to some of these panel questions. So one that I'd like to jump on uh, that came in very early. Um, how does competency-based education become a component of the lifelong learning framework that, that we're trying to establish here? Rovi, you're much more expert on that. I'll leave that one to you. Yeah, I think, uh, um, and so we're, um, uh, I was going back through too, um, you know, I think we're going to have a variety of different formats that are going to begin to um, uh, emerge as we as we move forward, and different components are going to help uh, in different ways. So if you think about, for example, competency-based education, and I was uh, in Wisconsin for a number of years at Wisconsin Extension when, uh, when we were working uh, uh, on that uh, competency-based effort for the state of Wisconsin, and so uh, we, we, we certainly know that um, uh, it, it opened the door for students who uh, didn't have um, uh, necessarily formal education, but may have a lot of informal education, but need to demonstrate that. I think competency based is going to be important in the realm of prior learning assessment. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, where we want to make sure that students are getting credit for what they know, but also that it's being validated appropriately uh, so that uh, so that there can be assessment there for for that. I think that um, uh, you know, competency-based education really is the focus on assessment. We've got to focus, uh, I think, all of us on increasing and improving assessment so that it gets to the outcomes that we want to see. But we also need great learning experiences. I think sometimes we, we believe that content is going to be so ubiquitous that uh, it's not necessary to think about it, and we hear those kinds of things thrown around. But really great content is still necessary to get to good learning outcomes uh, in many cases, and you're not going to get it all uh, free on YouTube. And so I do think there is a, a balance there between saying uh, uh, content is ubiquitous and all we need is competency-based education, great um, uh, great experiences that need to be developed and, and delivered uh, uh, to students, uh, as well as the opportunities to be able to use better uh, assessment than before to link this together. Um, I think there are a lot of moves to try to link competencies together through the credentialing mechanisms, uh, and I think we'll see more of that begin to happen. I think. Um, when you begin to see where those are well articulated with these digital technologies, uh, it increases, uh, for example, the throughput of, uh, of the registrar's office. Just very simply, if registrars, uh, if um, the student records can come in and be validated uh, almost instantly, uh, the, um, uh, the, the the speed of that alone is uh, the velocity that helps students move through more quickly is really remarkable. So I think it's a, uh, I think it's one. Uh, in critical component in the foundation of, um, of part of what's happening in higher education, but I, I think that the, uh, I wouldn't say that it's the totality of the solution. I think it's a part of the solution, but not the, uh, not the totality of the solution. Absolutely. Getting to another question, we, we touched on, um, on policy and funding towards the end. Now, if employers don't, won't, or can't fund education. Who else is expected to pay for education following the initial degree? Uh, that, I mean, that is truly one of the million dollar questions. Uh, the, the answer to a great extent is the individual. And, and I think Rovi brought up the idea of having education savings accounts like healthcare savings accounts. And I think things like that will emerge uh, we are also seeing a return to employer support. Uh, as programs become affordable, and a lot of the public sector 
entry into higher ed online recently has been re relatively affordable compared to historical tuitions. And even the extension school at Harvard is about 25% uh, of the tuition of the main school to make it accessible. But at those prices, uh, you can get a tax break. Your company can get $5,200 odd dollars of tax credit towards you. And you can often get employers to refund uh, if you do it. It's just growing right now because uh, employment is high. The other thing that we're seeing happen is the emergence of new entities like Guild Education who act as brokers between schools offering programs and companies who want their employees to be educated. If you remember, that was the Walmart $1 a day education. It's expanded to Disney and Discover and a lot of others. And this is the company saying, we will pay for it, but we're so suspect of the school's ability to complete the student on their own that we're hiring an intermediary, in this case, Guild, to be additional success coaches to provide the rest of those customer-focused learner services that the schools aren't very good at, quite frankly. And, and I see that model emerging and bringing a lot more people into school. If you're a if you're a learner today and you need higher education because maybe you're you you're out of work and you need to shift careers, um, uh, it's a it's a really difficult place to to operate. First of all, the the rules around even traditional financial aid aren't very adult student friendly, and so that's uh, I think that's one place to start and, and begin to look at that. But we know because we offer um, uh, over a hundred certificate programs here at, at Continuum College in, in uh, Seattle, and and they serve the Puget Sound region that even in our region, we look at students in different counties, and some counties have workforce support mechanisms in place for people out of work, but they vary which programs are supported very county by county. And so, um, but we know students who can find their way to some of these grants, uh, lock into one and, and get through a program successfully, and that turns their, turns their life around. It shouldn't be that hard for our students to find the support they need, whether they are employed or whether they're in between employment. I do think uh, it is going to be very uh, difficult. I think it will be a balance. The learner will have to have some um, uh, some financial uh, skin in the game here, if you will. But I also think that it's going to be incumbent on new policies to be able to bridge these gaps more effectively. And we see the beginning of that starting to happen uh, in some cases. Hunt mentioned a few great examples where companies are providing education. Uh, you know, my bigger concern is that we are in a very, uh, very hot economy right now, and as the employment picture changes, will we see that shift dramatically? So I think we have work to do on this one for sure. It's one of those areas that I think uh, that uh, is going to require some, um, some long-range thinking about how we address the, uh, the needs of learners who aren't in the workplace, don't have access to either workplace place training or the uh, tuition support that uh, some of the large employers can provide. So I think it's one of those areas. It is a gap area for us right now for sure. Absolutely. And just to close with a final question, um, we're talking about a structure that provides guided education or at least access to educational pathways from an, an individual's childhood years all the way through to whatever retirement is going to look like one day. With those multiple generations that are all engaging in lifelong education opportunities, how do you design programs and services that can meet their varied generational learning needs? Well, that's, that's a fun question. And I, I, I'm going to give a bit of a glib answer from Harvard here is you don't because we're not smart enough to do that for every individual. What we can do is understand the phases that they might be in and the transitions they might be going through and have products and services that align with those. And we can make those visible in a way that the student can find their own path through it. And if we're clever with our digital credentialing, we can credential it in a way that the learning across that stacks to something that's meaningful in the workforce. So I, I think it's it's be very a lot of hubris on our part to think we could figure it out for a learner. What we can do is give the learner the guidance that they can figure out what's right for them and help them succeed at it. 
Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's perfectly uh, said. I do think that we want to make sure that we don't assume that age equals stage as we're going through and developing these programs. It's amazing to us the number of people over 65 now enrolling in a program that we used to think was for mid-career professional professionals on starting your own business. And so I think uh, in, in our OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, getting more requests for not enrichment education, but very instrumental education for people who are taking on third and fourth act careers. So, so I think uh, it, it's incumbent on us to look at um, uh, these stages as being uh, more malleable, but then uh, uh, I think providing what's right for us strategically, I think we are many higher education institutions and we all won't serve everybody. So strategically choosing where we serve and then helping students move to the right pathway, even, as, even if it is not through one of our institutions, uh, will be absolutely critical to make that happen. Absolutely. And Fortunately, that actually wound up being a lovely conclusion. So with that, I'd like to sincerely thank our panelists for helping to put these ideas in context. And I'd like to thank you all on behalf of the Evolution and Destiny Solutions for attending this webinar. Thank you for your interest in understanding what a new student life cycle can look like and for being active in trying to figure out how your institutions can get there. We all appreciate it.